Well, Merry Christmas, New Hope. We are in the Christmas season, and I'm loving it. And I'm also loving that there's no snow on the ground. Praise the God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hey, well, I am glad that you guys are uh, here, and um, uh, we are going to be looking at Matthew chapter 2. So you can go ahead and turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 2. Now, before uh, we get started, I need everyone to pay very close attention, because this is a very, very, very important announcement, Okay. Uh, Right now, Pastor Jeff is in the chapel speaking a different message than what I'm preaching. What that means is that next week, I'm going to be preaching this exact same message in the chapel in the contemporary service, and Pastor Jeff, with his message, that's a different message, is going to be preaching here, which means that if you're here in the sanctuary or watching online and you can't be here, that you need to attend this same service next week, unless you love my sermon so much that you just want to hear it twice, okay? Uh, If that confused you, just go find Pastor Weaver, and he can explain it further, and you can be more confused, okay? Um, But uh, we we are just going to do this. It's been a very busy season at New Hope, and this helps us uh, just uh, uh, lighten the the workload a little bit, and we're going to do this flip-flop just this one time. So the title of my message is the presence of Jesus. And I absolutely love the presence of Jesus. How many would say that you just love being in the presence of Jesus? There's no place that I'd rather be. There's, there's nothing that brings my heart more satisfaction or wholeness or contentment. Um, it, it is something that is worth all of my effort and my energy. And it's something that is so precious to us. And it's available. It's not something that we have to wait for until we get to heaven where we're glorified and we get to be in the physical presence of Jesus. But Jesus has sent his presence to us through the Holy Spirit and we have access to him. And if you are here this morning and you have uh, just an un, uh, unrest in your heart or, or you don't have that peace, you don't have that joy, the presence of Jesus changes lives, it changes hearts, it brings healing, there is freedom in the presence of Jesus. And I just want to encourage us to be um, mindful of his presence, to pursue his presence, to begin to prefer his presence more than the presence of friends and family and the holiday things, that we would keep Jesus at the center of our hearts and in the center of our minds so that we might be able to walk and live in the presence of God Almighty. At the end of my message, I'm gonna call people forward to the altar. Maybe uh, during the sermon, uh, you feel that the Lord is convicting your heart. He's bringing things to light where things are out of balance. Maybe you haven't preferred his presence. Maybe it's been a long time this morning that you felt overwhelmed in the presence of God, and you've come to church faithfully week after week, and you've done all the right things, but the presence of Jesus just isn't the same. And you know you've experienced more. I wanna invite those who would just say, I am hungry and I am thirsty for more presence of Jesus in my life to come forward to the altar. The altar is a place that I love. It's a place that I've found forgiveness. It's a place that I've found healing. It's a place that I've found joy and peace and strength. The, the altar is a wonderful place and I believe that God wants to meet with all of you here. And so if at any point during this sermon the Lord is speaking and prompting to your heart, be ready to come out of your seats and come to the altar at the end, and that's where we're gonna be ended. Um, Would you stand with me, and we're gonna stand as we read. I'm gonna be reading from the NASB version, Matthew chapter two, and we're gonna be reading the first 12 verses. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem. They likely were from Persia, okay? From the east arrived in Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Now notice here that the Magi didn't know where King Jesus was. That they saw the star, but they didn't know where he was. They had to ask where he was. So, so what did they do naturally? They went to the capital. They went to Jerusalem. That's where they first looked, thinking that the king would be in the capital. They didn't, they didn't know. So what happens? 
Uh, next, they ask, when Herod the king, verse 3, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. Now, why would Herod be troubled? Because when he heard that there was a new king that had arrived, that there was this new king, it was a direct threat to his reign and rule. I just want to ask you this morning, when you hear of King Jesus, and we talk about him being Lord of your life and being king and ruler of your life, does your heart grow troubled because you realize that his lordship directly affects your reign and your rule? And the way that you get to use your finances and the way that you get to use your time and your energy and effort. Continuing on, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Verse four, gathering together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he, Herod, inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And then they would have read this prophecy. They, they went to the scriptures and found Micah 5.2. And they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. And they read this. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. Now notice here that Jesus wasn't a baby. It says that he was a child. And after you have found him, report to me so that I may too come and worship him. And after hearing the king, King Herod, they went their way and the star, which they had seen in the east, went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. A supernatural event where the star begins to lead them and it begins to move. I don't quite understand it. I can't wait to see that played out in heaven and get the play-by-play the, um, -play action of this. But I just, I, I love that. Verse 10, when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And after coming into the house, okay, uh-oh, it says that they came to the house. They didn't come to the, the stable. They didn't come to the nativity scene. They didn't come to the manger, right? When they came to the house, and don't worry, you, you don't have to, to throw out, you know, your uh, wise men from your nativity set. You can keep them in there, okay? When, when they came to the house, they saw the child, with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshiped him. Then, opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I pray this morning that we would be people of your presence, that we would learn from your word, that you would speak to us by your spirit, we need you, God. Allow me to speak and communicate uh, exactly what you need for this time, for this moment, and allow our hearts to be able to receive. We set our eyes on you, and we open up our hearts and our minds to your spirit. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. Now, you may be seated. Unless you want to stand the entire sermon, you're welcome to do that, but I imagine I'll be the only one standing this morning. I love the story of the wise men. Yeah, I, I love this story in scripture. It, it's very, very possible that the Magi or, or the wise men were the first Gentiles to worship King Jesus. Now we know on the night that Jesus was born that shepherds tending their flocks, they saw the star, they came and they worshiped, so it's possible. But, but these men from Persia, the Magi, the wise men, they were outside the physical boundaries of Israel. They were outside of, of Israel itself, and this was a foreshadow of what was going to happen, where it wasn't just Jews, it wasn't just Israel, it wasn't just the Hebrews that were going to worship King Jesus. It would be all people of all places, of all nations that would come and bow down before Christ the King. I love this. Okay, there are several things this morning that um, I could have extracted, but we're going to hang on three um, from our text. And the first point that I want uh, you to see is that to the Magi, the presence of Jesus was worth their effort. 
The presence of Jesus was worth their effort. Now, as I mentioned before, scholars believe that the Magi, also known as the wise men, likely came from Persia, which would be modern day Iran, meaning they traveled about a thousand miles to get to Jesus. And, and most likely, they came on horses. I'm sorry to bust your bubble, um, but, but they did not likely come on camels. They probably came on Persian horses, the finest horses in the world. That doesn't mean that you need to throw away your camels and your nativity sets. You can keep those too, okay? Um, I'm all for nativity sets. I think that uh, nativity scenes should be on every uh, government property is what I think, um, okay? But you won't be sinning by keeping camels in, in your nativity. And these three wise men, they were part of a group called the Magi, okay? Now, Magi were astronomers who studied astrology. What do I mean by that? They, they studied the stars, they studied the cosmos, but more importantly, they believed that as the universe began to change, as stars appeared and, and things aligned, that they believed that affected people and that there was significance behind it. The group as a whole, being the Magi, it's like a, an organization, the Magi, um, they were also magicians and sorcerers, okay? Now, uh, don't hold that against them too much, okay? Uh, they they um, uh, were just searching for a higher power. You know, having not grown up in Israel, having not known uh, and been taught and discipled from, from people who could lead them in the way of Yahweh, they're just searching for a higher power. It's no different than in today, we have many people who, who look to tarot cards and get horoscopes read and, and they mess with Ouija boards because they're searching for something greater uh, than themselves. But why did these three magi desire to come to Jerusalem? And this is very interesting. Some scholars believe that the magi were direct descendants of Balaam. Now do you guys remember Balaam? Balaam from Numbers 22 and 20, uh, through 24. Balaam and his donkey, that Balaam, right? There was a king of Moab who hired Balaam to try to place a curse on Israel. And what happens? He tries three different times, but the Lord would not let Balaam curse Israel. Right? In fact, Balaam um, was the first to prophesy about the star. In Numbers 24, 17, it says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob, a scepter will rise out of Israel. Balaam prophesies of this star. And that king in Moab that hired Balaam to try to place this curse on Israel, eventually Moab was conquered by who? The Persian Empire, okay? I, I know you guys knew that, it's just a little early, okay? Um, the Persian Empire. And so Balaam is here, he prophesies about this coming star. Now the philosopher Philo, in his works, uh, The Life of Moses, he calls Balaam a magos, M-A-G-O-S, which is singular of magi, okay? Magos being one, magi being many. And it's very interesting in that same work that Philo calls the magicians and the sorcerers in Pharaoh's court. You remember back in the book of Exodus when Moses goes to, to Pharaoh and he says, let my people go. You know, let my people go. And what does Pharaoh do? He brings in these magicians. He brings in these sorcerers. And Philo calls these guys also magos, the magi. Okay? Could it be that for hundreds of years, the descendants of Balaam were talking about a coming Messiah? Could it be that when the Magi were looking back at their history and they were looking back at their Persian history, that time and time again, they would open up their text, they would open up their history, and they were told of a story where God of Israel delivered his people from the hands of Pharaoh. That, that God prevented a curse on Israel and that there was a God that was supreme over Israel. Could it be that as they looked at the text and they heard the stories that they were reminded of this prophecy of Balaam, that there would be a star? These Persian men traveled a thousand miles to get in the presence of Jesus and to worship him. It was a nine month trek. Can you imagine the amount of resource that that would have taken? 
Can you imagine the amount of effort that they, that would have taken? Why would they do that? Why go to all the hassle? Could it be that they were expecting something great to come from Israel? Could it be that through their history, and as they looked and they heard the stories, when they saw that, that the God of, of uh, Ruth and Mordecai, that, that, or Esther, Esther and Mordecai, Ruth and Naomi, Esther and Mordecai, could it be that they remembered that there was a God that protected them from the Persians? And that this God was God of everything. And so when they see this star, they're expecting something great. They're expecting the son of the most high God, Yahweh. I want to ask you this. If the wise men made that great of an effort just to be in the presence of Jesus, then why don't we make a little bit more of an effort? For some of us, we don't really have an expectant heart where we have either forgotten the power of the presence of Jesus Christ, where we've forgotten that in his presence there is healing, there is wholeness, there is freedom, there is joy, there is peace, there is strength, there is love. We've either forgotten that or you just plumb don't know. And we don't value the presence of God. Maybe it's because we've forgotten what it's like and we've become consumed with the things and the temporal things of this earth. If you are feeling convicted in your heart about the amount of effort that you put forth into being in the presence of Jesus, I'm gonna invite you to come forward to say, God, I want to be a person of your presence. I want your presence to dwell inside me and around me and to be in my home, to be in my thoughts, to be at the forefront of, of my, what is worth it for you to be in the presence of God? You know, fasting is a difficult thing. It's not easy to go up with, with no food for two or three or four days or seven days or 10 days. But is it worth it to be in the presence of Jesus for you? You're getting up and, and coming to church. You know, I know there's many people online that can't be here, and, and we understand that, and we're so thankful for online streaming. But for some people, it's just become a little bit too easy just to sit in your couch, in your bed, in your jammies, kind of multitask as you're going along. But to get out and get up and get early to be in the presence of Jesus, our King, is it worth it to you? Is it worth it to come and worship the King? It says that where two or three are gathered, there I will be with you. There's something powerful about coming together corporately, about lifting our voices and worshiping and pursuing the presence of Jesus and inviting him into our hearts. When, when we are in the presence of Jesus, anything that he requires of us doesn't feel like a sacrifice. It doesn't feel like a sacrifice because it's worth it. And to these wise men, for whatever reason they valued, they saw that it was worth it, worth their effort to be in the presence of Jesus. Do you? Do you? The second thing that we notice is that the presence of Jesus demanded their expression demanded their expression. When we see the Magi encounter the presence of Jesus, we see expressive worship. Verse 10, it says this. Now this is after they have gone to Jerusalem, after they have uh, gotten it, and they, the star like reappears, or it, it appears in a brighter way. I don't understand exactly what it is, but this is, that they realize that this is the Lord, this is leading to them Lord, and what does it say? When they saw the star, the second time, and they've, they've come, when they saw the star, they rejoiced, exceedingly with great joy. It doesn't say that they just rejoiced. It doesn't just say that they had joy. It says what? That they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Now, on Christmas morning, I have never, ever seen a child open up a wonderful gift and rejoice exceedingly with great joy like this. Why is that? Why is that? Because something as fantastic as a, a fantastic gift deserves a fantastic response. 
And when we stand in the presence of Jesus, doesn't it bring about an emotion? Doesn't it trigger a response? Doesn't it stir within you the desire to rejoice exceedingly with great joy, to become excited? I mean, earlier I told you that I selected the NASB, which is the New American Standard Bible version for a particular reason. And I'll tell you why. First off, the NASB stays as close as possible to the literal, literal um, uh, readings of the, of the original text, preserving the literary structure of that while still being readable in English. It's a very scholarly um, translation, and I always read it side by side with my preferred translation of the text. It's, it's a very good thing. Now, if you're wondering, what is your preferred translation of, of the Bible, okay? I will tell you, in my Sunday school class, in room 212, reading the good book well, it's a Bible study methods class, and I'll give you all the reasons why I choose a particular um, you know, translation, but I'm not going to tell you now, okay, because I don't want to do that to you. Actually, I don't want to do that to me, because there's some people who wholeheartedly disagree. But um, the main reason why I chose the NASB this morning is in verse 11, it says this, after coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshiped him, okay? Raise your hand if in your Bibles it says that they bowed down and it worshiped them, okay? Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of head nods and stuff like that. This is where the NIV and many other translations misses the mark. In the Greek, fell down or bowed down literally translates to falling uh, down violently, to collapse. It gives the imagery of something radical. This wasn't just this polite kung fu bow to your neighbor bow, okay? Um, th this was falling down, being shattered in the presence, literally falling to the knees. It, it gives the imagery of walls falling down. How many have ever seen those YouTube videos? Um, or a few years back when the YMCA downtown got detonated and they placed the dynamite all the way around the building. And, and have you guys seen those where the building just like collapsed and it's like, how do they do that without creating a mess? You know, and it's just boom. This is what happened. When they entered into the presence of Jesus, they fell down, they shattered, they completely went down on their knees. They were pulled down violently. They fell down and then they worshiped Jesus. They fall down and they worship Jesus. See, the presence of Jesus demanded their expression of worship, and I wanna show you a few scriptural expressions of worship, okay? These aren't Pentecostal expressions. These aren't charismatic expressions. These are scriptural expressions of worship. Psalm 47, verse one, it says, clap your hands, all you nations, and shout to God with cries of joy. Psalm 134, two, it says, lift up your hands in the church. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. Psalm 95, one, come and let us sing for joy. Let us sing, church. I wanna hear you sing for joy. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. And again, I'm verse six, come and let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Now these are all scriptural expressions of worship. Now I get it. Many people's experiences of church and worship were maybe different growing up. But there is something that happens that is unexplainable when our outward expression begins to align with our inward feelings in our hearts, where we begin to become overwhelmed with emotions and we just allow ourselves to let go. Can I just encourage you sometimes, New Hope, to let go, to just let go for God's sake. And I don't say that as a flippant idiom. I say that literally for the sake of God, to let go in your worship, to clap your hands, to lift your voice, to wave your arms, to move with the music, to lift your voice, to sing a new song, to let go and express. Why? Because you're, when you're in the presence of Jesus, you can't help but do that. When you are in the presence of Jesus, 
that, that it just brings out an emotion. How many have ever been in the presence of Jesus and you just began to cry? Raise your hand. Okay, how many have ever been in the presence of Jesus and you felt weak, like just weak at the knees and you just feel weak, right? How many have ever felt stronger in the presence of Jesus? How many have ever just been where you're just like, I can't hold it back, I just have to praise God in the presence of Jesus? Why? Because the presence of Jesus is powerful. Now, I want you to hear me, church. I am not saying that we all need to express ourselves the same way. Do not hear me in that. Do not hear, because I'm not saying that if you lift your hands, you're like an A plus Christian and everybody else is C Christians, okay? I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. Don't hear what I'm not saying. What I'm telling you is that when we're in the presence of Jesus, it's okay to express. It's okay to express. I wanna ask you, does your expression of worship truly reflect your heart? Does it accurately reflect your heart? I often, whenever I'm, I'm helping on worship team, leading, you know, whatever it is, I often close my eyes. Do you know why? Because then I'm not distracted. I'm not looking at what other people are doing. If someone's being loud or they're waving their hands, I, I, it doesn't matter. I just, I just close my eyes. It creates a little sanctuary where I can just encounter the presence of Jesus and then I'm just gonna emote how I emote. I'm just gonna express how I express. And it sometimes is different. Sometimes there's times in worship where I'm just still and I just, I, I'm not even singing, I'm just, experiencing the presence of God. There's other times where I just, I can't help but to jump. You know, I used to, when I first went, and this is nowhere in my notes, and I hope I have time for this. When I went to North Central University uh, Bible College, okay, um, I remember going into something called praise gathering, and praise gathering was 10 o'clock on Wednesday nights. That's way past my bedtime now, but in college, that's like your prime time, okay? And it was just like two hours of dedicated worship and prayer. And I remember people jumping up and down and running and, and just being all excited. And I kind of came in with a little bit of a judgmental spirit. And, and maybe you can relate this morning that when you see a worship team member and they begin to jump or they begin to move and they begin to just go like this, well, they're just faking it or they're just all about themselves or they're trying to draw attention. Or maybe it's that they've experienced the presence of Jesus and it's bringing out of them an expression. That it's bringing out something that is natural. Can I just encourage you, if you're feeling like, man, I need to better express and show my love and adoration to our Holy Father, to King Jesus. I'm gonna invite you to come to the altar. And maybe you just feel like you're handcuffed. You just feel like so afraid because you've never done that. And you just feel like, oh man, there's times where I want to, but I just don't know what my spouse is gonna say. I don't know how I'm gonna feel. I don't know what this is. And you just feel tied in that. God wants to free you from that. It's okay to express our emotion. The last thing I want you to see this morning is that the presence of Jesus released their extravagance. The presence of Jesus was worth their effort. It, it uh, demanded their expression and it released their extravagance. Nowhere in scripture does it separate giving and worship. Nowhere. Giving was and is a part of worship. Take a look at verse 11 where it says this. After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshiped him. Then, in a continuation of worship, opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, gold, frankincense, and myrrh were the best resources that Persia had to offer. They were the very best that Persia had to offer. The Magi brought their best before Jesus. Let me ask you, did you bring your best before Jesus this morning? What do I mean by that? Did you bring the best of your attention before Jesus? Or have you been on your phone throughout the sermon? Because 
the way that we pay attention to Jesus is a direct representation of how we're giving ourselves. Because it says, worship the Lord and love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Are, are we just tipping Jesus and just saying, oh man, I, you know what? Year in contributions, I, I, I could probably afford a little bit more of a tax deduction, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna max out my tax deduction this year. Or are we bringing our best where it says, God, I don't, I don't care if it blows past, if it doesn't benefit me one bit in the eyes of the state or in the eyes of the law, that I'm just gonna give to you because God, if you require, if you ask it, I'm bringing my best, I'm laying down my gold, I'm laying down my frankincense, my myrrh. Are we giving God our leftovers? Or are we really bringing our best? Some of you are sitting on talents that we don't even know about. And listen, I don't want you to come to New Hope because you've got a talent and we can use you. I want you to use your talent to glorify God. And if your talent glorifies God and you should be up here where we should have 95 people singing in the choir, then you should get up in the choir and make a joyful noise unto the Lord. If you can clean and you can work and you've got a young back, guess what? Your work can be your best and can be worship unto the Lord. When I go in and serve in the nursery, you think I want to? Absolutely not. Okay, But when, when I'm helping with a kid that's having a difficult time, that is worship unto the Lord. Why? Because there's a mom or a dad that gets to be in the presence of Jesus because I'm saying, hey, I'm taking this difficult child. Do you know that there's a huge need in our church right now because there are more and more children that have autism or have a special need and they need a one-on-one. -on -one. And I can't fathom being a parent caring for a kid that has extra needs and not being able to be in the presence of Jesus and not being able to have a break, not being able to come to the feet of Jesus and be restored and refreshed. Your work, your sacrifice, it's not easy. It's not easy to get to church at 8.30, go to Sunday school and then serve at 11 o'clock. Are you bringing your best before the king? Because he is worthy. King Jesus is worthy. He's worthy. And as we live in his presence, can I just remind you that there is nothing that feels like a sacrifice. I'm not saying that we don't have a sacrifice, right? It says, offer your bodies as living sacrifices unto the Lord. You know, do these things. But when you're in the presence of Jesus, it's just like, God, you can have whatever you want in this moment. I'll do it, I'll do it. It doesn't even matter. It doesn't matter because your presence is everything to me. Church, do you prefer the presence of Jesus over the presence of men? Do you prefer the presence of Jesus over the luxuries of life? Would you stand with me this morning and close your eyes? bow your heads. I'm, I'm leaving plenty of time. I'm chopping a whole bunch of stuff out here. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And, and this is how we're going to end. We've got plenty of time. And so please, we're going to end here in just a minute with a song, Make Room. And if you feel this morning that the Lord has been speaking to you, I'm gonna ask you to leave out of your seats, come down to the altar, and we're just gonna pursue God as a church, as a church family, as, as a body of believers, as the bride of Christ. So right now, with every eye closed and head bowed, this is to prevent distractions. Allow the Holy Spirit of God to begin to speak to your heart. God, we tune in to what you have to say. Help us, Father, to hear your voice. I wanna hear you, Jesus. Would you speak to my heart, God? Is there any area of your life that falls short in expressing your gratitude?
for what God has done. As the Spirit searches our inmost beings, is the effort that we are putting forth to be in the presence of Jesus, is it adequate? Is the way that we express adequate and pleasing before the Lord? Is your love poured out extravagant or is it calculated and moderate? Search us, God. Search us and reveal our hearts. With every eye closed and head bowed, how many of you here this morning would say, this morning I realize I need to prefer the presence of Jesus in a new way. And that I need that fire that is within me to be just kindled and, and built up into a big flame that I might prefer Jesus, that I might long to be in Jesus' presence more than anything else. And you say, I need to get back to where I once was. I wanna get back to the presence of God. Would you just raise your hand with every eye closed? Yes, yes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your presence. I thank you that you are a God who loves us, that you have uh, sent your Son and you're sent your Spirit, that you're constantly giving to us. And so this morning we simply receive from you and I ask God that as there are hearts being drawn back to you, being drawn back to your presence, I pray that you would overwhelm them. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name you raise your hand or you feel like you need to respond this morning, would you come forward right now with every eye open, every, clo- every uh, head up? We're just going to come down to the altar. Would you come and step out of your seat right now? If that's you saying, I want more of the presence of Jesus. I want more of, I'm going to pour out my best upon you. And let's church, as a church, begin to pour out our praise on him. I want to leave you with one final thought. That before the Magi were in the presence of Jesus, before they came and worshiped and they fell at his feet, they collapsed at his feet and they worshiped Jesus, they couldn't hear God. They had to ask where Jesus was. They had to go to Jerusalem and say, where is he? They couldn't hear God. But in verse 12, it says, and having been warned by God in a dream. After spending time in the presence of Jesus, you begin to hear God clearer. You really begin to hear God clearer. And as we prefer the presence of Jesus, all of a sudden the noise of the world gets turned down and the voice of God gets turned up. That's what we need. That's what the church needs. Are you willing to make room for Jesus this week? Are you willing to get up that extra 30 minutes early and say, God, I'm going to turn on some worship music. I'm going to turn on some William Augusto soaking, just pad music. And I'm just going to invite the Spirit of God to be a part of my parenting today so that I can have grace for my children. I'm, I'm going to invite God to be a part of, of my work day today that I might be a light in a dark place. Will you really make room for Jesus to do whatever he wants to this week. Maybe for some of you, the Lord's been prompting on your heart that fasting is something that you need to do. Guess what? You're not gonna die. (laughs) You know what I tell uh, parents of kids that won't eat? You know, because they drink too much chocolate milk and they get all their nutrients through chocolate milk instead of food. I say, well, just give them water. They're not gonna starve themselves. They're gonna eat, right? Man, we, we need to become hungry for the appropriate things, the things that will satisfy our, our heart and our soul, which is the presence of Jesus, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Heavenly Father, I pray right now a blessing over your people. I thank you, God, for the hungry hearts, and I pray that you would just give us a glimpse of your goodness. It says, taste and see that the Lord is good. And so, God, would we taste, would we see, would we experience, God? And would we know that we don't have to wait till Sundays. We don't have to be in small groups. God, we can encounter you in our trucks. 
God, at our workplace, in the noontime, in the mornings, in the evenings, that you are Emmanuel, God with us. So let us be a people. Let this be a church that values your presence. And may it change our minds. May it change our way of thinking. May it change our hearts and the way we feel about things. We love you, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. May God's face, his peace shine upon you. And may uh, you be blessed.